Good evening, good morning, and good, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for your patience in waiting for us to, uh, to start the event the, this, this, this evening in India, at least. My name is Sara. I'm an adjunct professor at the Center for Water Research, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at ISA Pune. And that's the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the second season of our monthly talks at the Center for Water Research. The center was launched in November uh, 2020 to facilitate interdisciplinary research, both applied fundamental and um, uh, uh, place-based research around various aspects of water to climate change and um, various, things, various things linked to water. This season, we're looking at various ways in which we can communicate around water, primarily because we're concerned about what water ethics and what that means for us, given so many competing uh, challenges around uh, water in our world uh, now. And I think um, we need this kind of um, moral compass to guide us when we think about water from a lens that is both linked to issues around justice, but also uh, sustainability, given competing um, use users and users. And so Professor James Westcote, who will be introduced uh, shortly, is our first speaker to launch this uh, season of talks on, on, on water ethics and also around uh, the arts, because season is being curated by the Live Living Waters Museum, which is a virtual repository, which we launched in 2017. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But the talk this afternoon is also uh, co-hosted with the MIT Water Center. And it is my pleasure to invite Kirsten, who is the president of the MIT Water Club, to say a few words about that. And then I'll hand over to my colleague, Pushkar, who is going to moderate and introduce our, our uh, speaker for the evening. So Kirsten, over to you. Hi, yeah, thank you so much. So as you said, I am uh, the president of MIT Water Club. I'm a graduate student at MIT. Um, I've only been a part of the Water Club for a year, but it's been around since 2012. Um, and it's changed a lot over the years, but its primary purpose is to serve as a hub for anything water related on MIT's campus. Uh, so. Our core membership is around 20 or 30 people, but we have a large network of people we've connected with all over the community, all over the world um, and within the university. So um, you know, our main focus is to facilitate connections between people in water um, and connect people with opportunities. Um, one of our main events that we host each fall is the Water Summit where we bring together a group of diverse minds in water around a common theme. So this year our theme is gonna be coastal cities and ecosystems. Um, and so we have panels, we have networking, we have activities um, all around our uh, shared connection to water. So um, that's sort of one of our, we have a couple of other events throughout the year, but they all sort of um, coalesce around that goal to um, bring together people um, and connect each other over water um, and see kind of what comes out of that. So, you know, we love doing stuff like this where we're able to help out um, to bring in, you know, people with expertise um, that we can learn from. And I know we've worked with uh, Professor Westcote before. Um, we're happy to you know, be in collaboration with him um, anytime. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. Okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, Kristen. And thank you for endorsing this, this talk. Uh, but before I hand over to Pushkar, just a few house rules to keep yourself muted during this talk, to keep obviously cell phones uh, switched off to write any questions and comments you may have in the chat box, but we will also allow you once the talk is over to, uh, to raise your hand or use the em uh, emoticon, whatever over there to ask a question as well. Um, so with that, it is my pleasure now to hand over to Professor Pushkar so 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 Sony, who is the chair of the uh, humanities and so social sciences faculty at ISER. And uh, Pushka, I'd like you then to please introduce our speaker for the evening, Professor James Westcote. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Professor James Westcote needs no introduction to people who know South Asia or 
have been working with water. Uh, but let me just say something in two or three sentences, uh, which of course cannot encapsulate uh, all his achievements. He is the Aga Khan Professor Emeritus of Landscape Architecture and Geography at MIT. Uh, he has been involved with the Aga Khan Program in Islamic Architecture at MIT and Harvard for the person. He has worked extensively on South Asia, particularly Mughal Gardens, and some of that work has won a lot of awards. Um, again, he's worked with water policy research in various uh, geographies around the world, the United States and South Asia included. Uh, and he works on what he calls intermediate scale regional water systems. Of course, uh, he is no stranger to the Center for Water Research at ISAR Pune being on the advisory board. Uh, and it's of course our great pleasure to welcome him and host him for a talk on, uh, as it's titled, Reconstructing the Duties of Water in India on the Prospects for Value Pluralism. Thank you. Please. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Pushkar and Sara and Kristen. And I'll try to share, share screen now. Uh, yes, fine. All set. Okay, terrific. Thank you again. And it's really, a, for me, a great opportunity to share some new ideas about uh, water ethics and values and uh, and also to help contribute to this uh, question of what are the contribution of the arts uh, to a new uh, water ethic that the uh, Center for Water Resources at ISER is taking up as its theme this year. Um, at, and this is part of a larger study of comparative water ethics and value pluralism for me. I was not sure initially how to address the uh, uh, emphasis uh, on the arts in this paper, uh, but I settled on an approach that will combine a um, process of storytelling and mapping. Now, this is going to be the genre that I'll try to uh, develop here. And my story is going to begin uh, on a hot summer day in Lahore, Pakistan, about 30 years ago, in a conversation with an environmentalist friend about the distress of thirsty animals in the city. Uh, and that uh, study uh, led to um, a paper on the right of thirst for animals in Islamic water law. As compared with animals' access, actual access to water, uh, both in the Punjab and also in uh, my home state at that time of Colorado, where there is no acknowledgement, uh, even up to this time, of either a human right to water or an animal right to water. Uh, states in the U.S. don't recognize uh, uh, such rights. Uh, and so the paper underscored the fundamental right of, uh, to water in Islamic uh, water law, but it also uh, uh, kind of uh, came to a realization of the importance of social duties uh, to ensure access to water, which had uh, accomplished uh, uh, some important uh, oh, uh, standards in the U.S. context. So uh, in the mapping uh, process here, let's just put this study on the map and proceed about 15 years later. Uh, I began working on a state duty, which is known as the public trust doctrine. Uh, that doctrine is, uh, establishes that uh, states have an inalienable responsibility for the lands and the waters that they hold in trust for the public, and especially uh, deals with coastal waters. Uh, it, now, the paper retraced the public trust doctrine from its origins in Roman uh, law uh, to uh, various European uh, bodies of law, and the bottom left uh, map uh, displays this in more detail, uh, U.S. and colonial laws. And, but the paper culminated with an extraordinary um, uh, set of cases, uh, public interest litigation cases in India. Um, and two in Pakistan also, uh, that greatly expand the scope of the state's public trust uh, responsibilities and duties well beyond uh, the precedents in other parts of the world. So we add this to our map. Then some five years later, I became interested in an irrigation standard, a standard of agricultural water use known as the duty of water and wrote a paper that traced its origins uh, back to steam engine efficiency of all things in the United Kingdom, uh, James Watts steam engine there, but then forward uh, to canal irrigation uh, systems in Northern India, including the upper Ganga Canal, bottom right, 
uh, to, and also uh, interestingly, uh, to uh, the Western United States. Now the duty of water standard uh, establishes, uh, is concerned with the careful management of water without waste. Interestingly, in the US context, it established a, um, a rather uh, a lower bound of use. You have to at least irrigate 60 to 80 acres per CFS of water delivered. In India, the irrigation um, uh, standards were uh, at the other end, the upper bound. How much land can you spread water over? And so there the standard was regarded as a much higher 218 to 1600 to 600 acres per CFS a type of deficit irrigation that actually helped to you know, fuel the groundwater uh, development patterns that occurred in, in subsequent decades uh, to make up for the deficits there. Um, now this standard, the duty of water standard was superseded over time and gave way to other um, measures of irrigation efficiency. But it led to the question, if these were the duties related to water in the 20th century, what might be the duties that we should be considering in the 21st uh, century? And in a couple of papers, uh, the conclusion of a couple of uh, papers that I was writing uh, started to compile uh, possible duties and associated ethics, uh, which are uh, listed here. And I, I don't want to go into them because the approach that I'm going to kind of take uh, leaps off from this. Uh, uh, point of, of research to uh, uh, a different approach. And uh, that approach was related to the work, water, work that we've been doing over the most recently in Maharashtra in the rural drinking water sector, uh, where we've been uh, uh, interviewing uh, in villages uh, what the current conditions of water service are, places like in the left-hand slide here, an image of uh, in Bor Toluca just upstream of you all in Pune. Uh, and uh, I include the image on the right uh, with, not for our picture, but for the portraits of the leaders above us. So you'll see in this Zilla Parashad district office, uh, Jatrapati Shivaji, Dr. Ambedkar and Gandhiji, uh, who have profoundly different views of uh, uh, and values with respect to water governance and social duties. And I was struck by just how, what a range of inspirational uh, figures were on the um, um, wall here and started to take photographs uh, in other district headquarters. And you can start to see that they range all across the political spectrum and then also have religious figures and Maharashtrian saints. Uh, and I said, wow, this is really an insight into some of the values that are shaping, uh, or that might be shaping uh, uh, local administrative practice in Maharashtra. Now, um, in all of the studies that I've been uh, mentioning, the uh, uh, concept of duty was important, but it was examined somewhat informally, descriptively, and not so much on a theoretical level. And the same was true with respect to values and what I've called value pluralism, the multiplicity of values uh, in a place and how they relate to one another. Um, so the aim of this talk is really to clarify what one means by uh, water duties and also value pluralism and to show how they might be relevant for the rural drinking water sector in India. Uh, now, the process of clarifying duties for me turned out to be a surprisingly long journey. Uh, it began with a search for ideas about duty in the uh, water, international water ethics literature. And we've been proceeding from uh, left to right here and then uh, shifted toward the question of duty in Western ethics. Uh, then uh, from that to the concepts of duty in Indian ethics and ultimately hoping to arrive at a sense of what uh, duty means and could mean in the field of Indian water ethics. So this is our outline and I'll just hit a few high points for each of these steps along the way. Uh, it was uh, surprising uh, in the literature on international water ethics and the compilation or a listing of them is some, some major works is shown here to see how relatively the bottom line was that there was relatively little writing in those works on water duties. 
and similarly, uh, limited writing about water ethics. There are some you know, important exceptions like the uh, uh, Marcelino Bot uh, Botan uh, Forum on Water Ethics I had some important uh, uh, works so on South Asia, but uh, the writings tend to be uh, problem driven and uh, very substantive and not, not so much uh, inclined towards uh, clarifying what's meant by water duties. So that led to the question, well, what does duties mean if it's not so much uh, uh, clarified or elaborated in international water ethics? How about in the field of Western ethics generally from which some of that writing is derived? And here we have uh, uh, kind of a, uh, three major branches of ethics in Western social thought, Western philosophy. And the one that's most relevant for us here is the deontological tradition, uh, which uh, is derived from the Greek word for duty, deon. And its leading proponent was Immanuel Kant, uh, focused on moral principles and who argued that pure moral principles or duties are disinterested. That is, they're not self-interested or concerned with the consequences of action so much as the rightness of the principle as an end in itself. Uh, Kant sought universal moral principles that are unconditional duties, uh, which he called categorical imperatives. The rival branch of ethics, uh, is, of which utilitarian ethics is a prominent uh, example, are, are called consequentialist approaches. Uh, where the idea is that one judges the rightness of, uh, of a rule uh, by the goodness which it produces by its outcomes or consequences. And so that uh, tradition uh, in philosophical terms, I think the, the importance for it in the water sector is this is very widely adopted either informally or explicitly in the water resources management. For example, in Boston, benefit cost analysis and other uh, tools of modeling. Now, each of these uh, traditions had associations with India. I won't get into them, but some of them are quite uh, complex or, or kind of complicated. But what we want to do is say, uh, okay, we have a very strong uh, tradition of duty-based ethics uh, from which one can draw, but what about uh, in the Indian context? Uh, what's the uh, parallel uh, bodies of thought that are relevant. And here I've found the writings of a philosopher in Canada, Sham Ranganathan, uh, quite useful for comparing Western and Indian ethical traditions. And uh, among many other things in the work that he's done, uh, he's kind of drawn parallels between these Western traditions of uh, virtue ethics and consequentialism, and particularly for our purposes, deontological ethics, with different uh, South Asian traditions of, uh, of thought. And uh, in this case, uh, as we'll see, the uh, predominance of uh, uh, ideas and resources on Dharma. Uh, he's had to do a lot of critical uh, argument uh, against a, a view that classical India had, didn't have uh, very uh, fully developed uh, systems of ethical, ethics and ethical philosophy as compared with other branches like logic and epistemology. And I, I think per persuasively he argues also that that's a, uh, a flawed uh, interpretation of Indian texts and the, the, the ethical uh, tr principles as well as traditions are uh, quite uh, highly developed uh, and uh, worthy of study as ethics as well as um, uh, the epics. So let's take a look then at uh, the three concepts of duty. Uh, this is the kind of story up to this point. And then th thinking about the context in which I've read about or in practice in the field, heard about uh, ideas of duty that seem worthy of um, closer study, three came out, stood out uh, for me up till now. And I hope you'll suggest some others that should be considered. But this first idea of Dharma, it can't, can't be under uh, uh, rather overemphasized because almost every time you will pick up a, a work on the concept of duty in South Asia, Dharma comes to the fore. And that's, as we see, is going to be a very complicated uh, uh, task to try to understand uh, 
uh, exactly what that means and all of the different many meanings that it, it has. Um, but in addition, we want to highlight two secular concepts of duty uh, in the Constitution of India and in the laws of India. So the second item B here is the fundamental duties in the Constitution of India, that is the duties of citizens. And the third is I'll call uh, executive or administrative. These are the duties of the state. This is our outline. So let's proceed to this first question of Dharma. And just take one text uh, from the Dharma Shastras. Uh, uh, in my initial search, and I haven't gone through the, uh, the hits that they found here, over a thousand references to water in many of the ritual acts, but it's, it goes beyond ritual. If we take just one Dharma Shastra text, the Manava Dharma Shastra, Laws of Manu, from the very first uh, 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 slokas there on uh, that deal with uh, cosmology, uh, water figures prominently. Uh, but then there are all kinds of uh, uh, topics of consecration of water rituals, purification rites, prohibitions of pollution of water uh, are called out in, uh, and what sorts of uh, penance is required or uh, judicial actions are required uh, to correct wrongs that are done. Now, th this is uh, an uh, extraordinary, extraordinary uh, uh, body of text, but there are some questions about, well, what's the modern relevance of this when there are so many um, issues uh, associated with uh, uh, Dharma traditions in the current context? Let's uh, look at uh, the different points of view that have been expressed there. Uh, and for this, I'll, I'll just suggest uh, one volume uh, from the Harvard series on religion and ecology, this Hinduism and ecology volume. And in that, um, there is an extraordinary range of uh, views about uh, uh, the relationship between Dharma and environment. And we can also uh, make the connections between uh, water with water as well. So uh, some essays uh, uh, celebrate uh, what they call dharmic ecology and the contemporary relevance of uh, dharma traditions. Other chapters are very critical and say, look, if you look very closely, you're going to find all kinds of uh, environmental uh, uh, harms and uh, and disruptions and damages uh, that are present in these texts. And, he, and Lance Nelson used the example of the Gita. Uh, the late Anil Agarwal uh, wrote an essay saying, can Hindu beliefs and values help India meet its ecological crisis? And I, I, I'll urge you to read the essay. I won't tell you what he said uh, as an outcome. And then there were th three chapters on uh, rivers per se and the uh, crises in Yamuna, Ganga, Narmada that involve uh, the uh, kind of tensions and conflicts between the Dharma and uh, actual conditions in the river. Uh, there, it is a live tradition. Uh, there are recent water studies in the Journal of Dharma. There's a, a lot of contemporary uh, discussion on the Dharma and the theories of action uh, that are uh, relevant, uh, it seems to me. So uh, uh, this uh, kind of suggests that there's a lot to work with, but there's also uh, an extraordinary plasticity in the concept of Dharma. And there's also uh, a lot of uh, concern there. Are, you know, a lot of this uh, uh, earlier texts are rooted in uh, caste-based, family-based Dharma and other types of traditions against which uh, modern India has uh, been working in uh, the secular context. And so before we turn to that though, let's add one more dimension of Dharma traditions uh, relevant in the Maharashtrian context, which is uh, this topic of uh, in the particularly uh, lively field of debate in the 19th century of what was called Dharma Maharashtra Dharma, and which applied not to persons or groups, but to a whole region and to a people uh, that uh, was uh, seen as a way of thinking about uh, regionalism, uh, nationalism, self-rule, and related ideals. Uh, now, that this is complicated because it was historically anti-Mughal, anti-foreign, sometimes exclusionary in its politics. Uh, but again, it's surprising how many water references uh, come up in this work, and in particular, some of the things that uh, 
uh, both Prachi Deshpande and Ayan Feldhaus have written about with respect to uh, river symbolism, pilgrimage networks and the construction of regional identity and the mobilization, political mobilization uh, around um, uh, land uh, and water resources. So having kind of laid out some of these uh, uh, aspects of Dharma traditions, let's shift from the religio-cultural category of duties to the secular ones that I'd like to uh, put on the map, so to speak. Um, and in particular, look at the constitution of India and to this uh, section of the constitution, which uh, highlights the fundamental duties of all citizens in India. So here's how the fundamental duties uh, figure into the constitution. Uh, if we look at the articles uh, and uh, those preceding the fundamental duties, they address fundamental rights. That includes a negative duty, which is that there should be in the, in the, under the right to equality that there uh, must be no uh, exclusion or discrimination against the public uh, use of wells, tanks, bathing gods, and so on. Uh, the directive principles are those of the state. Uh, but in uh, 1976, this additional section called citizens duties was added on fundamental duties and there are various schedules of other ways in which uh, water uh, uh, topics are to be addressed at different levels of, of government. But this is how the fundamental duties fit and uh, if we uh, see uh, the substance of them, uh, one of them involves a water uh, duty. Uh, and it's this uh, duty of every citizen to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. Now, this portion of the constitution is non-judiciable. In other words, you can't uh, uh, file cases based upon this article. However, uh, what's surprising when I did a search uh, the, the Indian law uh, uh, legal search um, uh, on fundamental duties and water, uh, it identified you know, hundreds of hits in high court and Supreme Court cases in which these um, fundamental duty has been cited in support of a decision. Uh, and so that uh, shows that even though you don't uh, kind of have a judiciable uh, point of law here itself, the uh, uh, law can be, can draw upon it in support of a, a decision that's being made. Let me give one example uh, that's a very recent case involving uh, Greater Noida, where there was a filling of some uh, uh, community tanks in a village in the Greater Noida area. And this is Jitendra Singh, the Ministry of Environment. And the, uh, uh, the court sided uh, with the public interest uh, litigator uh, against the approval of the filling of these tanks and said that that was not appropriate. But what's interesting here are two, two items. One is that um, the uh, court said that these uh, public uh, uh, duties of citizens collectively uh, can be constructed as a duty of the state. And it went on to say that, you know, cite examples of how that had happened in the uh, cases brought by MC Meta uh, in the uh, Ganga context and elsewhere, but also indicated how the, uh, this uh, duty had been used to support the idea of mandatory environmental education for all school students in India, where the fundamental duties that are enshrined in this Article 51A are um, uh, uh, drawn into uh, the development of the educational system of the, uh, of the entire country. That's a very powerful uh, connection uh, between this fundamental duty in the constitution and what happens in, the, uh, uh, in public policy and environmental education nationwide. Uh, this, is, this, this part of the constitution can't be uh, uh, said to be uh, unqualified or simple ideal because you know if you think about this amendment which brought this in this was a very controversial amendment to the constitution uh, during the time of the emergency so there's all kinds of ways in which it's complicated uh, what this duty how this duty figures in uh, with the uh, larger 
uh, process that brought it into being. Nevertheless, uh, it's, it's important. Now, uh, final topic here is the question of uh, duties of the state. Uh, and in particular, we're interested in duties of the state with respect to water. And we've done some write, writing recently on um, the very long-term historical geography of uh, the water institutions in India and particularly drinking water institutions, beginning with Arta Shastra. Uh, and that's going to be speaking mainly of the duties of a king uh, to develop certain water resources uh, for uh, uh, the larger benefit of the kingdom uh, and duties to, to kings. Uh, so this is on the levels of uh, kings and, and doesn't really usually get down to the level of villages. Similarly, Aini Akbari in the Mughal period on water administration, uh, fairly limited on water. Uh, this expands greatly uh, with questions of public health and sanitation in the 19th century. And uh, uh, then uh, in the new constitution uh, for India, that directive principle section is the one that starts to uh, articulate the uh, uh, duties of the state. Now at the national level of the constitution, uh, the directive principles actually are, are, are uh, do not speak directly uh, to questions of water, uh, but other statutes uh, and policies do. And I've just flagged the Maharashtrian one here. Uh, and, but then also the importance of the 73rd Amendment in 1992, which uh, brought in uh, a, a empowerment of Panchayati Raj institutions, that is districts, blocks, and villages, which historically have had the main responsibility or duty for developing drinking water supply and sanitation. Through From the 19th century onward, it's when it's been made explicit, it's the villages that have this responsibility to self-supply or sometimes with some support from the state to supply uh, water uh, for themselves. Now, having done this uh, review of the religio cultural, the duties of citizens, the duties of the state, ask, and asked ourselves, well, how do these figure into the actions that occur uh, in drinking water planning and programs in, um, in India at the local levels, these Pantiati Raj institutions? Then district and block and what what how do they shape uh, what people do and why they do it uh, what they think is right to do and why it's right uh, this is so complicated I just include here uh, when, from our you know more field research here who are the uh, uh, actors uh, at these local levels uh, the persons who are in the photograph that I've uh, put at the outset of this talk. All these different figures uh, shaped in varying ways by the different uh, ethical traditions uh, and more. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Dharmic ones, which are include familial types of connections as well as uh, uh, state responsibilities. We've mentioned the Arta as well as Dharma uh, sources, uh, the types of expectations and standards of uh, administrative practice that uh, are relevant at all of these levels. And so it, it leads to the question or the recognition most assuredly that this is a, a context of value pluralism uh, in which all of these different uh, traditions and uh, uh, guides are relevant, but in ways that are not uh, empirically that well understood or when they start to interact with one another or potentially conflict with one another, pose dilemmas with one another, uh, that too is a challenge of value pluralism. So we want to ask uh, really on behalf of the public policy question, but also uh, as uh, different actors are engaged in water planning, how do they uh, uh, kind of articulate and then explicitly grapple with challenges of value pluralism. So value pluralism, just to make it clear, involves uh, plural moral duties uh, uh, involving water. So it's a really, a, it's plural ethics and it's related to other types of pluralism, but those are somewhat different fields. So I've flagged them here and we've mentioned some examples of political, religious and legal pluralism, but value pluralism is somewhat uh, distinct. And the, the, what a 
philosophical questions are, are ones where one asks, is, is there one moral duty uh, related to water or more? And so in the utilitarian tradition uh, strives to articulate one um, duty uh, or measure well-being, happiness, uh, against which uh, all of the different uh, and, and very different uh, types of interests can be weighed and measured to come up with a realization of what action uh, is best uh, for society. In the uh, deontological or values uh, uh, duties-based tradition, there's a recognition there can be more than one ethical value, though Kant and others uh, argue that one should strive for a single universal value. Uh, we can ask uh, uh, correspondingly, are there, is there one way to evaluate failures of moral duty where the state has, for example, failed to uh, fulfill a duty, uh, either didn't do it, didn't do it well, didn't do, do it right, or in a way that was good. And if there are conflicting uh, moral duties, uh, uh, how are they, is there one way to address them or more than one? Now, my special interest, those are uh, questions a philosopher might ask, uh, but as a geographer, I'll say, well, why don't we take a look at how these duties and conflicting duties might be, um, play themselves, be distributed on a map. And so here, I'm just gonna give a example from a, 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 a diagrammatic approach to some of these duties of water and, uh, and uh, see what the current situation is, just as a first first uh, indication of where I'm going with this type of analysis and what the next steps will be. In this uh, map or diagram, we have with the new Jalajivan mission, a declaration that there should be universal access to piped water supply and tap water in every household. Now that universal access and the duty to provide it is going to be uh, and interesting uh, to address from an ethics standpoint as well as from a pragmatic one. It's recognized and in the field work that you do that the toughest challenges are often in what are called remote and hilly habitations, uh, places that belong to a village, they're a habitation within a grand panchayat, but they're disconnected, often marginal uh, environmental terrain, sometimes marginalized people, how is that duty for, to be fulfilled? Uh, once the access is provided, uh, huge concerns uh, with whether uh, it proves to be and can be uh, sustained. Uh, piped water supplies and tap connections uh, are vulnerable to all kinds of uh, uh, challenges of sustainability. And for whom does that duty, uh, on whom does it fall and how is it uh, to be sustained? If all of this is successful in bringing new water and sustaining it over time, those increased water supplies uh, result in a, some additional problems of environmental drainage. And so these drainage problems, um, uh, to whom do, does that uh, duty fall? And uh, on what grounds is it uh, uh, to be fulfilled? Because we see in so many, uh, of the built environments, uh, poor drainage conditions. And so one can anticipate this is going to happen and the Jaljeevan mission even has a acknowledgement that this is likely to happen, but how will it be addressed and by whom? Ultimately, if all of these things are successfully wind up uh, with the uh, return flows in wastewaters that end up in Nalas and we know the conditions there and the question uh, of, uh, of how Nala's can be addressed uh, in as ethical questions as well as practical ones uh, comes to mind. So this is just a map and a suggestion that it's going to be different people with different justifications and perhaps slightly different uh, definitions of duty that are relevant in each of these spatial and geographical contexts. And so as we start to uh, articulate what those are and for where and for whom, it's interesting to uh, uh, indicate uh, uh, some of the ways in which these different um, challenges uh, fall to different uh, social groups and with different types of uh, uh, rationales. Uh, so that 
kind of we see a pattern in how the state, the nation state, and the uh, states such as Maharashtra are incre have been increasingly involved in financing and supporting the construction of new water supplies. But then the sustainability of them uh, falls to the local community. Uh, and the ethics of that community uh, and the duties that it assumes and discharges are going to be have a different rationale from those of the state in the initial construction. And we can imagine how these are going to be in alignment or well coordinated with one another or not well coordinated with one another where they start one solution starts to generate other problems or that you have a more unified uh, uh, approach to duties that will lead to a uh, the type of good outcome that one would uh, aspire to. This is uh, uh, as far as the analysis has gotten up till now, the type of approach to uh, uh, the duties of water and value pluralism than in the work that I've done. And I would really be enormously interested in the types of questions and suggestions you might have for me. Uh, thanks for all of uh, my uh, colleagues and uh, supporters in uh, MIT and the government of Maharashtra and colleague JVR Murti and all of our wonderful graduate research assistants that have uh, contributed to the work that we've uh, done over the past five years. Uh, that's what I'd hope to share with you today. Uh, uh, Pushkar and so, uh, Sara, and uh, we really would uh, welcome any of the questions and thoughts that you might have to uh, help uh, push this type of work further. Thanks again. Thank, thank you very much for that. It was very interesting, and I urge everybody to uh, post questions, as a couple of people have done already, uh, into the chat box or raise your hand. In the meantime, I shall get started with a question. I have a few questions from the audience but perhaps it might be easier to club or pool some of them together. But uh, in South Asia, historically, the provision of water for farming and gardens was an important act of kingship. And the ideals of kingship in both Indic and uh, Persianate traditions placed a very similar value in the provision of water for civic welfare. And so water governance in many ways has been a central feature of governance and kingship. And do modern political and legal systems undermine the ethical and uh, uh, moral basis of water governance, reducing it to merely uh, uh, technocratic and uh, legal? It's a, it's a great question. And the, um, uh, on the duties of kingship, a good king, uh, you have many such texts that establish this. Now, the actual performance of that duty uh, is uh, not as well documented in, say, archaeological and epigraphic uh, evidence. So you would expect to see that the, the kings actually did this, when in fact, it seems that you know, to a large extent, the villages were on their own to dig their wells and to uh, construct their tanks. And there was a lot of local philanthropy, and the philanthropic sector played an important role uh, in different uh, regions of, of India. However, I think the, the really the important uh, uh, principle is that uh, there was in those early classical texts, but also at the current time, a sense that the state has this duty to its citizens and that endures. And it frustrates a lot of, I'll call it the more liberalization uh, kind of, uh, uh, philosophy which uh, doesn't uh, necessarily accept the principle that the state has a duty to provide water, but rather that citizens and communities have a duty to secure their own uh, water uh, with support from the state, but the primary duty falls on uh, uh, local groups. So there's a great tension between some of the liberal uh, and liberalization movement and the statist uh, tradition uh, and it's earlier that, that isn't fully appreciated as to the depth of the expectation of the, that the state will do this, a good state would do this for its people. And that is what helps to define what a good state is. Uh, that the, the good there is, is, is not fully appreciated by the 
more uh, uh, liberalization tradition in uh, water resources management. Now, uh, Amit Mitra has a question, which is, it's, it's really a comment that says, inclusion of Islamic and Christian traditions of water duties in India would be very useful because these traditions, as we know, are also centuries old in the subcontinent and in a syncretic way help to form contemporary uh, notions of water duties. This is really important. And that's why I began with the first study on the right of thirst uh, uh, and human right to water in Islamic water law. And the map that shows that really uh, this is a, a, a large uh, minority in India, particularly, but also uh, we've uh, found that uh, Christian Sikh traditions in Punjab uh, uh, have uh, uh, these types of uh, principles as well. Uh, very different uh, rationale so that if you take it in a um, uh, formal ethical sense um, uh, and generalize, try to generalize, the um, Islamic tradition is what uh, ethicists would call it a divine command theory. So in, in the revelation uh, that it's a, uh, a command from God that these duties will be um, uh, assumed and that uh, such rights exist this is, uh, for humans and animals. And this is either in Quranic or Hadith tradition. So that uh, how do you kind of have a divine command uh, tradition uh, of ethics uh, in dialogue with other approaches that are uh, that don't have that same uh, rationale or logic. This is the challenge of value pluralism. Uh, it's it's one that uh, for which there's enormous scope, uh, but it's not as fully uh, embraced up till now as it it could be or should be. And in the Indian context, that's particularly relevant when you look at major survey works uh, on Indian ethics. Uh, they rarely include. Uh, the ethics of uh, Islam or Christianity or uh, um, post-classical uh, types of sources. Uh, so, but that's uh, certainly, it would be very exciting to uh, pursue that. Tanchan Chopra has a question. How can the citizen take on the duty of environmental drainage? Would it not be community or state local institutions instead? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So if you think about it spatially, uh, the uh, challenge of environmental drainage uh, begins in the home. So we've sometimes called this uh, approach to environmental drainage a uh, gur, gali, and gal. So at the gur level, uh, the sullage water is either being uh, uh, discharged uh, into a uh, drainage or just discharged out just outside the edge of the of the home into the gully or the lane. Now at the lane level, uh, each household can do its thing by either uh, capturing that water for uh, small um, kitchen gardens, uh, for soak pits, other types of uh, uh, immediate onsite treatment or um, uh, then collaborating lane by lane, start to have uh, some uh, uh, more community-based or neighborhood-based uh, approaches to environmental drainage. And then as one scales beyond that, when the water is flowing from lanes into a choke, it becomes a gal or a village-based uh, challenge to be uh, addressed at a larger scale. But one hopes to uh, uh, tackle it as far back along that chain as one can. But you're quite right that uh, most commonly it ends up being uh, a larger problem because it is, is not addressed as fully as it can be uh, in the um, immediate sources of the drainage. Uh, Rabban Ahuja has a question. Are there ways to integrate the idea of water as a living being with that of water yeah. management by different actors? So moving the discourse from a static to a dynamic one. Yes, well, as a, and, and also the status of a living being uh, question is, a, is an interesting one. In New Zealand, that's been taken up explicitly. So in New Zealand, you have examples of that and you have uh, even a higher level of uh, uh, ontology if you consider the um, uh, goddess status of rivers uh, and uh, 
again, Anne Feldhaus in her book on water and woman, womanhood in Maharashtra has drawn attention to, it's not just Ganga or Yamuna that are goddesses, all of them, Godavari, Krishna, Bhima, are all uh, have the status of a goddess. And that brings in gender questions related to uh, water, but to uh, what extent uh, the kinds of engagement uh, with rivers as li living um, or as having an ontological status of their own uh, with human beings. This calls for maybe that, this is where I put a blank portion of the ethics where we're under, we do, we're kind of missing a major tradition of ethics that uh, should be added. They call it eco-feminist ethics, call it post-humanist ethics. There's uh, a number of possibilities that are coming onto the map that should be considered, but uh, uh, that would be a very, very creative and radical type of approach. There's a question from David Grunfeld, uh, which is in the context of indigenous ethics about water, the importance of relational values is starkly different from modernistic contexts. So for example, the river as your grandmother or as a deity. So could you comment on the relational values as part of the good that is dependent on ethical protection? <laughs> No, that's a great, uh, a great question. And, and so if I were starting to think about how to approach it, we could kind of approach it at the, uh, on the contemporary side of uh, theories of relational values. Uh, at the same time, we could also look at some of the more uh, classical sources of uh, a family dharma uh, in which uh, those familial relations are uh, uh, addressed in great detail. And, uh, and the complexities when they start to conflict with other types of uh, values also uh, uh, can start to be, you can start to see how those are addressed in different um, uh, sources and traditions in India. But one can start at either end uh, with the kind of uh, re-theorization uh, uh, based on contemporary relational philosophy, or you can kind of go from a traditional and, and try to see, well, to what extent these can square with one another or complement one another uh, in the kind of both a theoretical level, but also more substantive context. I don't think I quite nailed that one, but I think it's a, a great question. And uh, there is a comment from Seema Kulkarni, uh, mm -hmm which resonates with comments that have been made by people earlier, like Amit Mitra, which is the fund system in Maharashtra is a traditional community-based system of water sharing. But such communities usually exclude women and other exploited groups of people. And uh, uh, how much community is community, I guess. Yeah, so this question of inclusion and exclusionary uh, uh, traditions and, uh, and, and politics uh, is enormously important. And we uh, see, you know, great debates about this uh, in uh, his, historical sources so that whereas some traditions uh, are exclusionary of uh, say, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, this is in the Maharashtrian context of Maratha and non-Maratha, uh, uh, community is very inclusionary with respect to uh, anyone who can have a, a status in a Maratha uh, context, but it, it may be exclusionary of others. But then there are many who've challenged this over the years. So you think of Vinoba Baba saying, no, no, Hindus, Muslims, everyone is included in this uh, uh, community at large. Uh, and the uh, uh, all of the work on uh, water and uh, uh, gender work that Sarah and uh, uh, colleagues have uh, uh, advanced on uh, uh, the inclusion uh, of women. Uh, it has a historical or cultural basis for making that argument as well as a justice basis in the contemporary uh, world and uh, far from uh, fully realized. So this question of inclusionary politics has got to be at the heart of any ethical water ethics, it seems to me. Um, we have too many examples of the exclusionary uh, cases, but they provide examples that can be uh, very explicitly challenged. 
uh, we have a question from uh, Amitanshu Acharya. How does one ethically separate the social and the natural in religious practice? For example, <laughs> ideas of purity of nature in the Manaswati correspond with ideas of purity in society. So you have yeah. caste hierarchy and so on. So how do we disentangle this complexity? Okay, I, in a very si simple, perhaps simplistic way, I'd su suggest that we have uh, uh, several uh, major traditions of ethics that are either monist or dualist. So that for those dualist uh, traditions of say uh, philosophy uh, that distinguish um, uh, the domain of nature and spirit, uh, say uh, Sankhya yoga traditions would be one, which is a dualist. That, that you've got the origin of the problem right there. In other more monist uh, types of approaches, uh, there's a uh, ways in which these uh, relationships between the purity of persons and of, of uh, natural uh, conditions are seen as uh, continuous and uh, interrelated. And, uh, and so there's less of a, I mean, that's more conducive to the direction I think the question is, is, is heading. Uh, but in the dualist context, how can it be addressed? Well, either by uh, uh, the use of analogy to say that, you know, in this case, purity is uh, uh, defined in these uh, terms. And by analogy, we find it to be true in other uh, uh, species or uh, environmental systems as well. And so in the Islamic context, just as an example, um, there's the reference to um, the um, communities of animals forming, they, they form communities like you, I mean, like humans. So that type of analogy is a very uh, crucial uh, mode of reasoning to establish those connections and to strengthen them, it seems to me. Gopal Krishna asks, is it the case that Asian religions grapple with natural heritage, including water? And like non-Asian ones, is it not the case that Platonian or Kantian or utilitarian or Westphalian mathematical determinism undermine the rights of water bodies? Uh, this is a, a good question, but the um, what we have Try to do it a slide about halfway through is to show that there are uh, these uh, uh, kind of distinction between East and West. And all of it, you notice all these case studies I've done is about the, all the kinds of ways in which the flow of ideas and the interactions between even the North American and South Asian context have indicated close relationships so that the distinction East and West is, is probably more problematic than, than useful. Uh, and that even within each of these traditions, uh, sometimes when you really pursue them in uh, 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 kind of anal in, in greater depth, you find that they have a greater openness uh, to the types of values you may want to uh, uh, find uh, or uh, advance. You know, so that one of the you know strongest proponents for animal rights, so Peter Singer is a utilitarian, uh, ardent utilitarian. Um, and so you, you, you've got, I think, uh, 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 an initial perhaps point of contrast as a starting point, but always in both historical terms, but also theoretical terms, looking for the connections and the, again, the analogs. Uh, between traditions seems to me to be uh, a very, very promising a way forward. And now for the last question, unless somebody has a burning question, which absolutely needs answering today. Uh, the question is from Seema Kulkarni again, which asks, how does this understanding expand the scope of water governance? What is the message for duties of the state in the present context? <laughs> Right. Okay. This is uh, this is a great concluding uh, question, um, and I'd almost uh, want to try to answer it on on, on the multiple levels, um, because uh, if you think of state and state governance, water governance, it's uh, surprising how uh, each of the levels of 
uh, governance in the state and even in formal terms are so distinct from one another. Um, they're interrelated uh, constitutionally and otherwise, but their actual life worlds of the actors at the gram panchayat level and even sub gram panchayat in, in different habitations or bodies, uh, governance questions in that uh, context have historically been of one sort and the next levels up of blocks and districts uh, even though they're all grouped together as Panchayati Raj institutions, even back to Mughal times, I can find, you know, examples of how Perganas and other types of sub um, state uh, governance uh, were part and parcel of a larger uh, imperial state, national state. And so they, they have tended to operate differently, blocks and districts. Now, in the case of Maharashtra, the emphasis has been on districts historically. In other, in other states, it's on blocks. So in the Maharashtrian context, we've argued just in a very recent publication that came out last month or, uh, about the importance of blocks and that blocks are somehow uh, under um, realized in terms of their potential in water governance uh, and uh, in part because they have a, uh, oh, with, with about a hundred villages each, they, they have some greater homogeneity of conditions uh, that they can help address at the watershed aquifer level and so on. But historically uh, that's been less developed. Now, as we uh, go up uh, to the um, higher levels, the question that comes to mind is uh, consider the you know, ways in which the nation state, notwithstanding all the policies that argue for devolution down to local empowerment, self-rule of on the water sector, the nation state re retaining a very high level of in involvement, uh, say in the Jaljivan mission and specifying all of the kind of ways in which it's to be implemented as well as the uh, uh, bold aspirations for you know, providing water for all. So the, um, I think that there needs to be at each level and then across levels, some um, systematic uh, reflection on the duties that uh, they each have and the uh, reasons why the duties uh, uh, have, but also could take the, uh, a kind of more, Oh, progressive uh, uh, direction uh, in at each of these levels. Um, that type of uh, systematic uh, move from what I've uh, up to now, much of our work has been descriptive ethics of at each level, here's what each group does. In normative terms, what ought to be these water governance relations at each level between levels and of society in relationship to the state at each of them as well. Uh, that type of a systematic project would be a great collaborative research project for us, I would think, uh, at your center. Anyway, that's the thought. I would also be grateful if these the kind of 25 questions in the chat could be somehow copied. I know when we stop a Zoom, they disappear. So if anyone's able to kind of copy them down, I would be enormously grateful for that. I, I, I will send you a transcript of the questions. Great, thank you. Uh, there's one, one more comment from Gopal Krishna. Imagination of water duties as divorced from land duties seems to be inspired by a feudal and colonial legacy. So <laughs> oh, goodness. This is a great question as to um, the relationship between land and water and, and so many other sub, part, kind of subdivisions and categories. So when I speak of drinking water, it, the, 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 the initial challenge ought to be, well, how is that? connected with uh, irrigation and other types of uh, uh, water subsectors that have, have developed over the years. But the linkage between land and water is uh, uh, also uh, a, a kind of a kind of a fascinating history. Uh, and the uh, separation, they both, the, there's some very strong linkages so that with a groundwater uh, right, you have to have a land right oftentimes to pump 
uh, from an aquifer. So the land right gives uh, title to tapping the groundwater resource in many contexts. Uh, by contrast, a lot of property rights to water, irrigation rights are disconnected with the land. Um, is this a colonial uh, heritage? I think that's a really great historical question. Um, uh, it could be. Uh, it could be that the development of the large uh, surface water irrigation systems disconnected uh, water from the uh, uh, land in a very large scale types of ways in the large scale uh, 19th century irrigation systems. Uh, and from which we have yet to kind of find some um, well, ways of uh, reconnecting these, these resources. And, and, and even beyond that, uh, land and water uh, is separated from the uh, uh, habitats and ecological and uh, um, organisms that depend upon them it seems an even greater disconnect uh, through which water came to be regarded as a physical resource rather than an ecological phenomenon. All right, uh, thank you. And I'll hand it over to uh, Sarah to propose a vote of thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Pushkar. And thank you, uh, Jim, for this very exhaustive and extensive waterscapes in, in, in a way of ideas around uh, duties, values and ethics. And I mean, the Indian landscape is so very complex. It's faith, it's caste, it's gender, so many things, as well as, of course, the fundamental uh, uh, laws and the constitution, etc. Two points that I just want to bring up from my work in closing, because you mentioned um, hydro philanthropy and a lot of that was done by women um, in terms of the step wells in Gujarat and Rajasthan mm -hmm. which we've also been exploring in the Live Living Waters Museum in our work and I think and also the work of uh, people like U U Yuta Jain what we mm -hmm. find over there is that there are, I mean, whilst these were uh, meritorious acts to pro provide water for, for, for local communities, et cetera, very often the people who built these step wells, the artisans who were usually either uh, Muslims or from the uh, low caste communities were excluded from access. Mm -hmm. So you kind of then, you know, wonder what kind of, uh, you know, value ethic is that? And then the other one is from my own uh, PhD work in the late in 1986 on the cleaning of the Ganga in Varanasi. And I took that up as a topic because when Rajiv Gandhi launched the, the first Ganga action plan, he said that this is the program for the people of India, that we want everyone to participate. It is not a program for government officers, you know, by um, alone. And I thought to myself, how are people going to participate to clean a river, which they fundamentally believe is pure and sacred. And, you know, so that set off a whole chain of work and thinking in um, um, Va Varanasi for, for, for mm -hmm. me, like a sort of deep dive into uh, public health and history and administrative history and all. I found the work of James Scott very useful in terms of uh, inversing power structures and in, inversing hierarchies and what he talked about the weapons of in, in, in the weapons of the weak and what was unfolding in that context as well sometimes and how people contest these ideas. Uh, of course, you know, there was a lot of backlash on the Ganga action plan in the 80s because we had more of a soft state in power then than we do now. And um, yeah, and how there were notions of uh, dirt as matter out of place. What was on the surface may, may, may be dirty, but you know, the water underneath was, was clean and pure and so forth. And of course, many other uh, belief systems, but a lot of issues that uh, also arose on the ghats of Benares amongst Hindus and Muslims and who had access to which ghats and you know, what did what. So there is this complexity and these layers, it's like peeling and, um, an onion, you know, it's, it's, it's so complex in India, 
understanding and unpacking uh, values and ethics and, and so forth. So I want to thank you very much, Jim, for laying the, some of this uh, context out for us. Um, for the audience, there's a lot of work that Jim has done and shared with us. And if you're interested, we can definitely uh, uh, pass on some links and some articles and some PDFs to you, if that's something that some of you are interested in. Jim, if you have anything else that you'd like to, to share with the audience over here, I'm sure we can you know, try and do to that. And uh, look forward to your participation in the lecture next month, which has Amy Sharox, um, an artist based in the UK who started something called the Museum of Water there. Um, and Amy will be in conversation with me where we look at how water museums around the world look at this question of ethics and, and water and what kind of, uh, how we're sort of shaping the stories around water and trying to encourage a new uh, way of look, look, looking and thinking about water. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. I hope there are no more last comments and questions or anything else. But if you do have, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll be closing this now. Jim, any last words from you or? Well, just a, a great appreciation. Some of the best questions I've had in the talk. Uh, uh, so I really am uh, excited. I've written, written uh, them down myself, but I'll be grateful to the transcript so I can reflect on them uh, further. Uh, for many of the studies that I have, oh, uh, most of them are available full text on academia.edu or researchgate.net. So um, that would be a great source of PDFs for right. people or questions that you might have. And of course, the Ganga is a topic we should have for a special discussion uh, as uh, there's a, yet another chapter unfolding in that right now. Yeah, of course. We will also have a recording of this uh, talk, which everyone will have access to. I think uh, Shalini has shared a link, but Shalini does link YouTube. Uh, yes, I already gave the links on the chat and also gave the Twitter thread just in case if there are any changes to the link, people can go to the Twitter thread and check. Uh, but we have been tweeting live during the session, so there has been a, quite a bit of interest in this. Thank you, James. Uh, this was really, really exciting and also great participation from everyone today. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and we look forward to the next uh, talk in this season. Thank you so much.